meeting for community transit. <clears throat> We're holding this meeting virtually in accordance with the governor's stay at home order, Proclamation 2028. The meeting is being recorded. And will the clerk please conduct roll call? Thank you, Chair. Council Member Daughtry. I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Marine. Here. Thank you. Council Member Mead. Council Member Merrill. I'm here. Thank you. Mayor Nearing. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Labor Representative Norton. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Roberts. Here. Thank you. Great. Barely. <laughs> Council Member Schwedy. Present. Thank you. Mayor Smith. Here. Thank you. Council Member Wright. Here. Thank you. Chair, we have a quorum. I'll also run a quick roll call for alternates. Council Member Gallagher. Here. Thank you. Do you have Council Member Johnson? Mayor Matsumoto Wright. Here. Thank you. Council Member McNeil. Uh, Council Member Nearing. Chair, that concludes roll call. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we have uh, public comment. We have received one written comment from Mr. Joe Kunzler that has been routed to the board. We also have one person who signed up to speak, also Joe Kunzler. Uh, is he in the audience? Yes, he is. Could you move him over, please, Rachel? Mr. Chairman, I'm, um, I've already been moved over. Oh, you're already moved over. Okay, there you are. I see you. Uh, Mr. Kunzler, you have the floor. Thank you for calling me in hot, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you, too, Rachel. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, Joe Kunzler here. Um, I am... Um, now, I know this is April Fool's Day and not Groundhog Day, but I am still displeased over the board committee issue. I do want to stress that what you remember is had your newsbook broke PhD of the University of Washington says, quote, asking questions of our public bodies is the best way to ensure they are working for our interests and not those of politicians, end quote. I do believe there is zero harm in committee public observation versus the lingering harm that distracts from the good work that uh, community transit staff does. This is a motion for pause, you know, this is now going to be a perpetual political problem for board members until at least a motion for a positive change is voted on. Frankly, I would be pleasantly relieved if board members would make a motion today, please, or vote for the Zoom links to be publicly available, please. Um, I am also displeased with the lack of sharing on social media board agendas. The current board website requires a few clicks to find board information, and if yours truly can tweet out board agendas, so too can community transit staff. See, I want to turn to attempt to turn all public comment from Groundhog Day to a more inclusive, more informative experience for all. The awesome work of the community transit board staff deserves better than to be appreciated by a mostly white and mostly male audience of small number. Moving along, I made a suggestion about preemptive public disclosure in my written testimony. Sorry about any problems with the Excel spreadsheet with the raw data. Community transit may do as you wish, but I felt it was past time as a voracious reader of community transit public records that I said something strategically substantive. I also appreciate CEO Rick's testimony to the state house this morning. I attended the second that testimony to the state house saying I support carbon fee funding grants and to help community transit and scattered transit along. I wanna finally in these last few moments reach out to board member Norton I hope he understands my issues with policy and not personality. I hope all understand I'm still supporting community transit. I hope next month I could spend my public comment time discussing why we need a friendly negotiated merger with Ever Transit. Thank you everyone for the time. I appreciate this every month. I, I hope I'm giving you good quality public comment. And with that, I respectfully yield for about two minutes and a half in. Thank you, Mr. Kyler. All right. Uh, is there anybody else in the audience that would like to speak to the to the uh, board? Please raise your hand. Anybody else for public comment? Chair, I don't see any hands raised. 
nor do I. So we will move on. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will have presentations. Mr. Engelfritz, it's your turn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Greetings to the members of the board. It's nice to see you today. The sun is shining, at least for now. Uh, we want to begin today with um, the service award. Um, and uh, as you know, periodically, we come to the board to call out major milestones for employees uh, who have served the agency and the public for uh, in a distinguished way for over sustained periods of time. And today is one of those days. So we are pleased uh, to recognize Diane Sasse for completing 25 years as a community transit employee. Uh, Diane has been here 25 years. Her most recent role uh, has been working in our planning department as a schedule analyst where she started that role in 2018. Um, in this role, she works on all of our service changes. Uh, during the past year and the challenging environment we've been working through with the pandemic, she's played a key role in developing strategies for providing service that meets the needs of our customers while also keeping our operators as safe as possible. She's uniquely suited for this work as she spent her first 22 years at Community Transit as a coach operator and an instructor and was fantastic in those roles as well. I couldn't think of anyone better to work as a scheduling analyst than somebody who's been out there uh, driving the routes and training employees, other employees and colleagues to drive the routes. Um, she trained over 100 drivers in that training role uh, and one of her favorite activities in that role, I'm told, was serving as a commercial driver's license tester, which both allowed her to become a better driver and also a better instructor. She's received numerous uh, commendations from customers over the years, and she is a million mile driver. She's recognized by her peers as an amazing person, kind, loyal, generous. Her supervisor, Matthew, says, and I quote, I've been so fortunate to get to work with Diane and become her friend. She's an immense asset to CT, and I would be lost if I did not have her keen operational insight to rely on daily, close quote. Diane has two sons, Jacob, who's 23, Nicholas, who's 20. Nicholas is a music major over at Central in Ellensburg. Uh, Jacob completed his AA at Everett College recently is now, and is now looking at four-year opportunities. Her hobbies include fishing, traveling, cooking, and gardening, which means, Diane, you and I have much in common and therefore much to talk about. Her favorite trip traveling abroad was when she got to serve as a goodwill ambassador uh, to Europe and also had a great trip to Japan where she, believe it or not, climbed Mount Fuji. So, Diane, Congratulations on 25 years. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. Speech. It's been a pleasure to work here for that long. And um, I just wanted to say that I've met most amazing people here during my journey. And um, I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't been surrounded by so many good people. So thank you for the opportunity to work here. and. Um, I've appreciated every moment of it. Well, thank you, Diane. Thank you very much for your 25 years of service. We definitely appreciate it. And we know that the people behind the scenes are doing the best that they can to help CT move forward and continue being a, a safe and reliable uh, entity for our community. And you're just a part of that big team, but a very important part of that team. All right, um, uh, moving on. Uh, yep. Oh, do you have more? No, that uh, concludes our recognitions for today. We can move on to uh, the Linwood, Linwood pilot project. Okay, Director Marcicek. Hi, thank you very much. We're excited to be here today to share more information about the Linwood pilot project. Uh, last month, this was presented at the Strategic Alignment Capital Development Committee, who recommended it. Uh, to bring it here for a presentation item. The goal of the pilot is to really understand uh, the transportation needs of the people in Linwood and to test a new way um, to fulfill those options that those needs 
currently aren't being met. Um, we're very excited about this journey we're embarking down and learning more about it. And here to tell you more is Jennifer Haas, birthday girl, and Alex Min to share more. Good afternoon. Uh, Alex and I are super excited, as Molly said, to be here sharing this with you today. Um, we're going to give a brief overview of what's happened in the project to date and then also be talking about next steps for all of you today. So next slide. So a little background on the project. Um, we chose Linwood to be our first pilot for uh, testing new transportation solutions. Um, we are using grant funds for the project. We have a million dollar congestion mitigation and air quality grant that we're using. And we chose Linwood um, through a process about two years ago to um, really think about what was happening within that community. As you all know, um, Link Light Rail is going to be coming in just a few short years. And there's also a lot of development that's happening within Linwood um, that we wanted to see how we could enhance transportation services for people who had needs and um, how they were traveling around within the city and, and through the city. So as Molly mentioned, this really is our first opportunity to really learn how we could provide a different service outside of um, traditional models that we have, like with Christ Route and our paratransit or Vampool, and really learn about um, how a new service could affect uh, our customers and really study the benefits um, and the learnings from that process. So that's what the one-year pilot is all about. And then of course, um, being very focused on establishing performance metrics um, to measure success around the project and um, really make sure the learnings are captured well and see how we can um, either improve on the project or if it's successful, maybe move it into full implementation in for a service package. Next slide. So the primary objectives of the pilot um, are really to understand how people are traveling around the city and what their needs are around travel and transportation and accessing transportation. And then ultimately taking all of those learnings and de defining a new service that we could use to test what those transportation options are. And of course, through this, um, we wanna make sure we're complementing our existing services that we have within Linwood and hopefully making people um, open to having easy transfers if they wanted to say use a new testing service and uh, maybe catch one of our fixed route buses and connect that way or even connect further and travel outside the city on our existing network. So really looking at ways we can complement our existing services. Next slide. This is a really high level overview of the project timeline. Um, the project does occur in three phases. The first one, which I kind of briefly described, um, is called our needs assessment. That's where we uh, went through a pretty intensive process um, within the city of, of surveying and also working with some key uh, industry stakeholders within the city of Linwood and really learned about those travel needs and barriers. And we completed that work in February of 2020. And we're currently in phase two of the pilot project, which we call solution concept development. Essentially, that means taking all of those learnings and really trying to drill into what does that mean for a new type of service to meet those needs and what would that look like? And then phase three is implementation, actually getting the service out on the road. And um, as our timeline currently stands, we're anticipating and hoping to get that out sometime early next year, um, targeting the end of first quarter. Next slide. And this is just a high level overview of just some of the work that went into defining how we are looking at developing a new service. We call it uh, guiding principles and supporting factors. So if you look on the left hand side, um, we worked with our external stakeholders within the city, um, our community business leaders, and really wanted to dig in with them about what do they feel was really important for a transportation service um, for their residents and also for those that are just traveling through the city. And they came up with the, that list. They wanted the service to be dependable and equitable, accessible, um, safe, of course, uh, easy and convenient, and 
also available um, outside of what we would consider more peak hours. Um, so more kind of maybe late night service. And then and we took all of that information and from that um, really uh, developed what we're calling the supporting factors, which basically take all of those terms and uh, transfer it into information that we can use to help us in actually developing a service. So looking at where does it make sense um, geographically to operate service within the city based on those needs? What time of timing um, would the service need to run? How does it need to connect with our other services? Uh, what kind of barriers do people have to travel or transportation options? And then of course, COVID has been happening um, and it's still happening. So how do we take all of those behaviors into account um, when we're developing and testing a new service? And then of course, making sure all this aligns with Community Transit's own mission and vision. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Alex Main, who's gonna walk through the solution concepts um, that we are looking to uh, push out soon for community feedback and for testing. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I have the, I have the fun part. So I'm gonna talk about some of the new services um, that we're recommending to bring to uh, the public in a second survey um, and learn from and hopefully test one of these. So uh, the two I'm gonna talk about first um, are about microtransit. And this is, this is a mode that is, uh, it's transit-like, it's, it's, a, it's a version of public transit um, with the exception that it's a lot more flexible and on-demand. And flexible means that it will um, it can deviate from kind of a set route and be able to pick people up closer to where they are and drop people off closer to where they want to go. Um, and on demand means that there's not really schedules involved. It's closer to like an Uber or a Lyft where people can use their phone and um, see when the next vehicle is going to be close or, or schedule a trip um, and have that sort of access. So it's sort of a hybrid of, you know, your traditional fixed route um, transit system and something closer to like an Uber and Lyft, um, sort of the best parts of both. Um, and I'll just point out, you know, sometimes it's helpful to kind of think from end to end. You could imagine a user in Linwood that needs to go shopping at Alderwood Mall or maybe go to school at Edmonds College. They would pull out their phones, see um, when the next vehicle is going to be close, make that uh, make that trip reservation or schedule. And um, within a few minutes, a uh, vehicle will arrive, pick them up maybe at a, uh, a major intersection near their house and, and take them right to their destination. So um, even though you'll see some maps coming up in a little bit with lines on them, this is all very you know flexible as far as routing. Uh, next slide. So sometimes I think it's helpful because uh, you'll see some other maps. Um, Jennifer mentioned geography is a main, a major element of what we looked into in this project is um, I'm going to be recommending some areas, but obviously we can't serve all of Linwood with this pilot project. So um, sometimes it's, it's helpful just to see um, why we selected the areas that we did. And you'll, um, the maps later, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail, but effectively we looked at service gaps. So where are we not, we didn't, where do we not run a lot of service currently? And then other sorts of gaps. Where are uh, car ownership levels the lowest? Um, where are equity levels? So looking at all of those elements to get into where are we recommending services. And when you see the following maps, you'll see why we suggested routes that kind of you know bisect C and D and and circle sort of E where everyone is kind of orig originating. That's where a lot of multifamily dwellings are and where everyone wants to go. That's where Alderwood Mall and the city services are. So the rest gets into a lot more detail. Um, next slide, please. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, I kind of spoiled it up front, is a route along 188, uh, connecting Edmonds College and Alderwood Mall. So next slide, please. So it's essentially, um, you know, everything I talked about with, with microtransit, so the flexible routing, it's more of kind of a service area and not a, not a fixed route. So even though you see a red line on the screen, it doesn't mean that this is a, a bus that's making stops along those line. Um, there's a half mile or a mile buffer on either side where this, where this route could you know, deviate depending on customer need. Um, there's a couple things I wanna point out with this particular route. There's obviously two major destinations on either end and lots of 
opportunities in the middle. You have Highway 99, you have the 44th Area City Services, um, and it actually builds off of work that our own planners had done before. Um, and so the next slide is, we're gonna talk a little bit more into the Alderwood Circulator. And this is really focusing in on zone E, the, uh, that's the Alderwood area. And even though it's not really, you know, there aren't roads that make a perfect circle because the zone really encompasses it. So there may be a route that kind of travels along it, um, but essentially it's meeting people where they are within that zone. Lots of development going on in that area, lots of opportunity. Um, in a much kind of more defined geographic space. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just gets into a little bit more detail, zooms in a little bit. You can see where current service is, that's kind of the purple marks, and where a circulator could potentially run along 44th and kind of up the sides. Um, and essentially, really, that the, the coverage area is that entire region. So um, basically any of those apartment buildings, any of those destinations are covered in this option. Next slide. And I'm gonna shoot it right back to Jennifer to chat a little bit more about the community van program. All right, great, thank you, Alex. So community van is a concept where essentially uh, through a partnership with the city of Linwood, we would have uh, van full size vehicles, you know, it could be a seven passenger van or a 12 passenger van um, set at key locations throughout the city where people could access them to use for their own trip purpose. Um, they are driven by volunteer drivers, um, which do go through a kind of a training process similar to what our van pool drivers go through to be able to use the vehicle. But essentially, people can um, call and schedule a ride and meet the van, um, you know, if they wanted to use it particularly for, you know, uh, recreational use or uh, if they needed to pool together to go to, a, you know, a sports tournament, they could essentially drive to the location once they'd scheduled the trip, um, leave their own vehicle if they're driving or maybe they're walking there or taking the bus and then they hop in the vehicle and are able to use it um, for that day purpose. So it's essentially a way to provide people another um, means of public transportation um, in a much smaller vehicle. And um, we've found through our experience working with our peer agencies who have programs like this already that residents uh, primarily use it for recreational purposes, not so much for work trips, um, but more for after hours or on weekends um, for travel. But it's helpful for people who maybe don't have a vehicle large enough for the purpose of the trip purpose they need, or maybe for people who don't own a car, um, which uh, there are several pockets in Linwood that have high non-car ownership. So we thought this might be interesting to collect feedback from within um, the city on this option to see how people respond to it. Next slide. And then as part of our uh, kind of scoping process, um, we've been working the past couple months internally with, with work teams going through these solutions and ideas. And we did consider uh, a TNC or, or transportation network company partnership. Um, these are, most familiar to us as you know, the Lyfts and Ubers of the world, um, you know, very much on demand, uh, taxi style where you're you know, scheduling something on your phone and people are coming and picking you up and taking you where you need to go. Um, we did study uh, a particular partnership that Pierce Transit had uh, about two years ago where they used uh, Lyft to take people to key destinations, um, sometimes transit hubs within um, their city. And we did have some key learnings uh, from that process, um, which I'm going to cover in a second on the next slide. Um, but just also wanted to mention uh, around fares, uh, there is the ability to set a fare, uh, a flat fare, um, in a partnership with the TNC if that was a route we had wanted to go down. So uh, we did have that possibility um, when we were exploring it. So next slide, please. So through those learnings, um, especially with our partner, Pierce Transit, um, our, uh, we did find some uh, key concerns that we had in wanting to maybe try to do this as, as our first pilot or kind of first out of the gate. And a few of those factors, we just wanted to, of course, brief all of you on so you had a full understanding of everything we had explored. Uh, but we did have some issues around uh, kind of four main care or categories. Uh, the first one was drug and alcohol testing. Um, that is not something that current TNCs require. 
of their uh, drivers, but that is a FTA requirement that we have as a public agency. Um, so that was kind of a first hindrance that we found. And then there's also issues around accessibility and mobility issues for um, people who may have a wheelchair or may need a certain type of vehicle to be able to access public transportation. Um, those vehicles are not always available um, through a TNC. And then payment method can also be a challenge in figuring out um, how to do that and how to set it up and how to collect fares. And then uh, there's also some data restrictions that can happen in working with a TNC. So we felt um, while we really wanna be strategic in how we measure performance for this pilot, we wanna make sure we can get good data on the services that we're implementing. And we had some concerns here as well. So. Luckily, Pierce Transit was able to do all of this. Um, they were under a special sandbox grant, a federal grant that uh, was run by FTA, and they happened to waive some of these restrictions um, during that process. So that's how they were able to operate um, and learn. So um, we definitely haven't taken it off the board. We think it has some strong possibilities, um, potentially uh, in another pilot in another area, or maybe even at Linwood at a different time. There's just some uh, significant factors we need to work through. And we wanted to ensure we had something really successful out of the gate for the pilots. So that's why we were leaning more towards microtransit and the community van options for community feedback. Next slide, please. And then, so just wrapping up, next steps. Um, we're very excited. We're gonna be going to the Linwood City Council on the 19th of this month to give a very similar presentation to what you're hearing today. And then uh, for the project, uh, as I said, we're still in phase two in that middle section and we're right in the heart of developing our survey that's gonna talk about these essentially three options and start gathering feedback from uh, the residents of the city of Linwood to see if we've hit the mark based on the needs work we did back in, starting in 2019, wrapping in, in 2020. So uh, we're doing that survey design now and hope to have distribution of the survey um, before the end of May. So Alex and I are happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Jennifer and Alex. Appreciate your presentation. Does anybody have any questions for either? Questions, concerns? What's the meaning of life? No, never mind. Yes, yeah, I have a I have a question. Uh, this hey, is Tom. Tom. Um, could you share what kind of data restrictions the vendor, uh, what kind of data the vendor is reluctant to share with us? Um, I'm going to maybe ask Alex you to speak to that because you spoke, I know, in great detail. With so, you know, interestingly, a lot of it was around their pricing models. So Uber and Lyft are historically very reticent to say how their algorithms decide what pricing is what and how surge pricing comes into play. So that, that was a major element is we would not know how they're getting this sort of data. And then they also don't like to send origin or destination data. They, they try to anonymize it as much as possible, but um, the, the best you get is sort of kind of census tract level data, which is good, but, but not necessarily as, as fine tuned as we would want to get an idea of where travel's happening within Linwood. So um, they're getting better over time. That's why we still have them as like a future option. Uh, mm -hmm. But for now, they, uh, they, they don't want their competitors learning their own um, algorithms. Uh, and they like to keep that customer data to themselves. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Kim. Yeah. Um, I guess my question that I was thinking as I was listening to everything is what is the cost? And I think when all of this is done and it's brought back to us, uh, that's one of the things that's going to be my bottom line. Because if we're supplying all the vehicles um, and how many trips did they have to make to even pay, you know, so, so I'd like to see some costs. And that will be, um, that's a great point. That will be one of the pieces of work that's coming up. Um, we're already working with our planning team on kind of getting into the specifics of scoping out these routes and, 
you know, how many vehicles it would take to provide an ad adequate level of frequency um, to, you know, we don't want service that only runs every three hours, right? So um, Alex had studied many other projects around the country and have kind of tried to match up like geographic areas that are similar to the zones that we are proposing at this point and looked, looked at how often those routes are operating and kind of the boardings per hour and what the initial costs kind of on an annual basis are. And as far as we can tell at this kind of level of information we have, um, that million dollars hopefully will get us pretty close to a nine to 12 month period. But until we get a little farther down the road and know exactly um, how we're gonna be operating the service and all the specifics of you know, the actual operations, um, we won't know more until then. But that's kind of our initial homework has showed us that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions or comments for Jennifer or Alex? Mr. Chair, it's Rick. <clears throat> I'll just uh, build on Jen's excellent response there that uh, at the beginning of the presentation, Molly and Jen talked about this approach being designed to learn some things about providing mobility at, at, at a micro level. And so we're really interested in, in what we can learn here and how it might be transferable into other markets. Um, I think looking ahead as, as we get past this year's TDP and budget, um, you're going to be hearing from me and Roland will be undertaking a, a process to update our long range plan. And in that exercise, we'll, we'll want to have a conversation about how much of a commitment and how far we want to go with this type of service. It's really an area of innovation for us. Um, and this, this pilot project here sort of marks the start of it. Uh, but what we expect, you know, a lot of dialogue uh, over the course of the next year about, uh, you know, what what kind of mobility benefits can be derived uh, from this kind of service and, and how much does CT want to delve into it. Thank you. Well, I can tell you for sure that I'm really interested. I'd be kind of interested to see what you do with a thousand acre lake right in the middle of the whole thing. Um, because that's what we have to deal with over here in Lake Stevens. But I am very interested in this. And I, I, I too went outside the organization and looked at a few of these other things like Los Angeles and, and some of the others. I'm sure Alice, you've probably looked at all of them. Uh, it's very interesting the way they do it. Uh, everybody was different. And they had a different take on it uh, for the little bit of research I did. But I'm very interested in seeing what you have kind of what you come up with in Linwood. Um, I'm sure Nicola Nicola Smith is very interested also. She's sitting there shaking her head, and <laughs> uh, so it, I'm I'm going to be watching this one pretty closely. I, I'm really excited about it. So I think it's going to be great. Anybody else? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the Chief Executive Officer's report. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just jump right in and uh, start with a focus first on uh, internal uh, agency affairs. Um, I'm going to start to weave uh, COVID issues into my report as a matter of course. It's, uh, we're making a, enough progress now that I don't think we need to continue to report out on it as a standalone item, and I see that as a positive thing. But having said that, I'll start by talking about COVID and vaccinations. Uh, we've, we've had two uh, positive cases in March that I'm aware of. So the trend is very much in the right direction and we're very encouraged by that. Um, March 17th uh, was obviously a, a, a major turning point for CT in the fight against COVID. And I don't really think that is an overstatement. That's the day that over 70% of our workforce became eligible uh, for the vaccine. So we are spending quite a bit of time uh, communicating on a weekly basis with employees about uh, how we can connect them with opportunities to get the vaccination. Uh, among the folks who are eligible now are coach operators, mechanics, field supervisors, our ride store employees, service ambassadors. Um, so you know we're encouraging everybody to get the vaccine and we're providing as much information as we can about how to get the vaccine and we're asking folks to let us know uh, if they get vaccinated um, <clears throat> last i heard and this is probably an old count we were well over 100 employees uh, having started the process uh, and then yesterday of course uh, folks 60 and older uh, 
became eligible and, and the governor announced that as of April 15th, the rest of us will be eligible as well, which is my way of saying I'm not 60 yet. Uh, so we'll keep you posted on that, uh, but we're very encouraged with how it's going and, and uh, it really marks a, a pivot point in the fight against the, the pandemic. Um, in other news, we are starting to have more agency events. Um, some celebrating, some marking solemn occasions. Uh, most recently, last Thursday, March 24th, uh, we held a tree dedication remembrance for our colleague, Scott Ryan, uh, who we lost uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And Rachel sent you out uh, a link to the program uh, that we held that day. I wanna call out and thank Vice Chair Maureen uh, for attending and speaking on behalf of the, the board. Uh, it was a very positive event. The family uh, and close friends attended along with a number of employees and I'm told were quite appreciative. They hadn't had an opportunity uh, to, to, to have a, a service of any kind uh, since, since then. And, and so it was really important uh, for a lot of folks. So I also wanna thank all the employees who, who worked on the event, um, including the, the directors and, and everyone else. It really showed the caring culture uh, here at CT. Um, on a brighter note, earlier this month, I got an opportunity to address our incoming coach operator class. We've got, I think, uh, four working their way through the training right now. On March 12th, uh, we had a coach operator graduation, and we were able to celebrate two new coach operators uh, making it through their 10 weeks of training, uh, and they're now out on the road. Uh, and then on the 18th, it was uh, National Coach Operator Appreciation Day. Uh, so we spent uh, the day over at uh, Merrill Creek um, handing out thank yous and tchotchkes and recognizing coach operators for their service um, and all the work they do uh, in a public facing way to, to represent the agency. Um, so more to come there. Um, shifting to an operational snapshot, uh, ridership remains low. Uh, we're seeing shifts of 1% or so a week uh, up and down. Uh, a very slightly detectable trend upward, but nothing major to reflect a, a recovery so far. Uh, we're continuing to run service at 85% of pre-COVID levels, and that's enabling us to maintain uh, capacity to prevent overcrowding. Uh, only 0.1% of our trips got over capacity over the last month. Uh, we implemented our service change March 21st, it was a fairly modest service change. We really just made some fine tuning uh, adjustments in a few places to increase capacity to support social distancing with uh, a total of uh, 24 trips added. Uh, that'll also help uh, reduce some wait times in, in, in places on local service. But really the big uh, service change to come is, is September and we'll have more to say about that later. On the financial side, I want to say I think we are transitioning uh, from a period of uncertainty uh, to a period of opportunity. Uh, while our fair revenue remains down because of reduced ridership, as we've reported to the, to the Finance Committee and the Executive Committee, um, our sales tax is performing ahead of forecast. Um, and I know that uh, Chair Schwetty will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we're also seeing an influx of federal funding. You're well aware of the CARES Act funding we received last year. We've obligated all of the $39 million we received at that point. And we're now in a process uh, to settle the allocation of the CRISA funding through PSRC. Uh, we are meeting at a, at a GM level uh, to try to complete that process. And we have uh, kind of a general understanding right now of how that's gonna work. Uh, our goal is to preserve the earned share formula that we've used for years uh, to allocate funding to grantees. Um, so we're hoping to have something to report on that next week, uh, but I think we are making progress and it's dragging out a little bit because we're trying to settle the allocation approach in anticipation of the American Rescue Plan funding, which will be coming right behind CRISA. So, uh, we look to be well positioned to receive another 33 to 34 million in CRISA funding. Um, the American Recovery Act uh, is likely to bring uh, about 900 million additional federal dollars into regional transit agencies. Uh, 
So it'll be probably a little bit more than the CRISA funding. So at any rate, we're trying to get our allocation approach settled so we don't have to have this conversation again in another month or two as that third slug of federal funding comes through the, through the process. But what that means is we're experiencing it a bit of a moment here where our sales tax revenues are, are outpacing forecasts and our federal partners continuing to invest in transit. Um, it's going to give us an opportunity to look uh, closely at some one-time opportunities and how we want to take advantage of this to advance our mission and our goals. So we are in the process of some financial and long range planning uh, to set up a discussion about how to program these additional funds. And I wanna thank Roland and Jerry's folks for the work they're doing to, to prepare for that. And we'll start that conversation uh, later this month at our, our board workshop. And I'll come around and talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, continuing though on the financial theme, I wanted to update you as well on premium pay. So I've extended premium pay uh, one more time through April 17th, uh, the next pay cycle. Uh, we are working now to look at when it will be appropriate uh, to bring premium pay to a close. So we're watching vaccination rates and case rates very closely uh, to, to, to make sure that we've got an appropriate time uh, to make that decision. Our 2021 costs on premium pay through uh, mid-April will be about one and a half million dollars and we're continuing to use federal funding to help uh, underwrite that cost. Um, we mentioned at the committee level we got our bond rating updated. Uh, S&P up, upgraded us to AAA with a stable outlook. Uh, we had previously been AAA with a negative outlook due to the pandemic um, and the economic conditions and the dive in sales tax revenue we saw last year. Uh, but they've uh, reversed themselves and uh, have reported that the stable outlook reflects their expectation that resilient sales tax and the agency's management uh, and willingness to change course during a period of depressed revenues uh, reveals uh, essentially a, a an agency that is able to maintain its good credit quality. So we don't use a lot of credit. Um, but it's nice to know that if we need to, we have good credit and are available, available to, to, to use that as a tool if needed. Uh, shifting gears to focus uh, externally for a minute. Um, I'm continuing to get out and ride the system. Uh, I wanna thank board member Roberts uh, for hosting a visit uh, last Friday to Stanwood. Um, Molly and I rode the 240 uh, while well, the 202 up to Smoky Point and then transferred to the 240 and, and rode on up to the Stanwood Park and Ride and Sid met us there and uh, we had a nice drive around. Um, got to see the old uh, cute downtown Stanwood but then he took me up on the hill where all the growth is and it was a very different picture so um, I fed back uh, my observations from that visit to Roland and and obviously we'll be looking at uh, the implications of that growth as we plan for future service uh, in the area. Also got to see where um, CT uh, overlays with Island Transit and those places where we exchange customers in Stanwood. So a great visit. Um, thank you, sir, for hosting. Um, next week, uh, I'm gonna get out to Snohomish to visit with uh, Council Member Merrill and, and have a look around and meet with folks there. Um, and then also later in the week, we'll, we'll be going up to Marysville to, uh, to meet with Mayor Nairing and, and some members of his team uh, to learn more about Marysville's plans. So I appreciate everyone's time, making time for me. It's, it's been great uh, to get me up to speed on what's going on in our communities and, and the issues you're dealing with. Um, and I'll continue to keep you posted on, on these activities. I'm also uh, riding the service from home about once a week. Uh, I've been biking up to Aurora Village and riding the Swift Line uh, up to the office. Uh, just did that yesterday, in fact. So it's given me a great opportunity to chat with coach operators and, and, and experience the service as a, as a user. Um, in terms of external uh, outreach, uh, just today, we got a chance to meet with Senator Murray back in Washington, DC, and we had a great catch up. Um, she's continuing to provide tremendous support to us 
Uh, she supported our efforts to get the uh, CIG grant for the Orange Line. Um, she's also asked us uh, through her staff to submit projects for the infrastructure package. So we went through some of those uh, investments that we're proposing. And of course, she's just been stalwart in terms of uh, uh, the relief funding over the past year. So it was great to catch up with her and work with her staff. And I think they're very enthusiastic and quite bullish uh, on the opportunities that are going to be there to continue uh, pushing investment into infrastructure uh, over the next year and beyond. Um, also connected with Senator Leas, um, who was my, my last uh, state legislator, at least for this session that I've been trying to track down and meet with. And we had a great catch up as well. Um, and uh, obviously he's a strong supporter of the agency. Uh, speaking of him and Olympia, a uh, session is ongoing. And I think we're well positioned for current law uh, funding uh, to get our regional mobility grant for uh, the Blue Line extension. There's also uh, new revenue packages coming together in both the House and the Senate. And just this morning, uh, I testified at a hearing on Chair Fye's bill on the House side, uh, which includes allowances for out-year funding for our Green Line extension to Bothell, uh, the Gold Line to Smoky Point, and even the Silver Line, which is uh, our, our twinkle in the eye BRT line between Seaway Transit Center and Cathcart. Um, so that's great news. Uh, Chair Fye is, is thinking long-term and, and, and contemplating a long-term connection and, and partnership with, with CT, so that's great. Um, also uh, spoke in favor of uh, he and his colleagues working together to forge a compromise with the Senate uh, to get a package actually into law uh, and noted our interest in uh, funding for the US-2 trestle as well, which our service uses uh, along with many others. Um, other external meet and greets met with the head of the Snohomish PUD um, to talk a little bit about zero emission vehicles, uh, met with leaders of uh, Snohomish County uh, leadership, Snow Isle Libraries, the Economic Alliance, Snohomish County Public Works, and a few others. Also spent a few minutes on the phone with Mr. Kunzler uh, talking about our activities and committed to working with him to make sure we're disseminating our board agendas and materials uh, more proactively through our social media channels. So we'll see if we can do something about that. So I wanna switch gears now to talk a little bit about our board workshop upcoming in a couple of weeks. Um, I've talked with some of you uh, uh, individually and at the executive committee. Um, we have an agenda planned that will report out of comprehensively on the past year and how the agency has experienced and come through the pandemic. Uh, we're now in a place where we have year over year data in terms of finances, uh, ridership, service information, and so on. Uh, we also wanna talk about what we see in the future in terms of steps we have planned and, and need to take in order to recover from the pandemic uh, as we get through the vaccination process. So it really is an opportunity to talk about the pivot point we're facing now as, as we come to the end of this and, and can start to think about the future uh, more ambitiously and more proactively. So that's sort of the first major item we have on our board workshop agenda. And then the second one is to spend some time diving into uh, the zero emission fleet study uh, that we've talked about a few times. Uh, Roland's been working on a scope for that study and we wanna uh, engage with the board and have some discussion about your expectations for that study. Uh, some things that um, we expect to look at just to make sure we're looking at the right stuff um, and give you an opportunity to ask questions and, and weigh in on how we approach that work. Uh, it's pretty important work. Uh, there's clearly uh, going to be a significant uh, interest and investment on the part of state government and the federal government in transitioning the composition of transit fleets at the national and state level. So our timing is pretty good here. Um, so we'll be able to draw on some of the learnings of our, our fellow transit agencies and also look ahead to, to where we see the policy um, environment going. Um, to whet your appetite for that a little bit, we had a, a kind of a mini event uh, this past Monday. Uh, we were visited by two vendors of uh, zero emission coaches. Uh, we had a new flyer 
hydrogen fuel cell bus, 40 footer, and an Alexander Dennis electric bus, uh, double, double tall. Uh, and you see the pictures there on the left and right. Um, it was a great opportunity to literally kick the tires and look under the hood uh, at these vehicles. Um, the vehicle on the left uh, is powered by hydrogen. There's hydrogen tanks on the roof and a hydrogen fuel cell uh, aft of the rear axle that is, uh, powers, essentially produces DC power for, a, for a, an electric motor. And then the double decker bus has eight battery packs that, that power uh, hub motors on the drive axle. So uh, really interesting and cool vehicles, obviously lots of implications uh, in terms of, of infrastructure to support these vehicles and, and training folks to operate and maintain them. But uh, a good kickstart for, uh, for the study. Um, last but not least, I want to conclude uh, at the end of the packet today, you'll see a nice thank you message that we received from Sarah Higginbotham. She's the executive director of North Snohomish County Outreach, uh, and they took possession uh, of, a, of a surplus van pool vehicle through our Van Gogh program uh, earlier this year. And she shared in her letter that that's making a tremendous impact at their organization for how they're able to support their clients and their community. I think it was my third day at the agency where I got uh, taken over there by Deb and Molly, <laughs> got an opportunity to, uh, to meet some of the recipients of those vehicles and learn about that program. So it's great to get that kind of feedback. Uh, and I really want to thank you and, and, and the board overall for supporting those programs because they do make a difference in the community. So Mr. Chair, I know that was a little long winded, but uh, that concludes my report. No, you're just slightly over your three minutes. It's not a big deal. Um, does anybody have any questions for the CEO? Okay, seeing none, I will move. Next is the committee reports. Uh, I will report for the executive committee. We met on March 18th. Uh, Council Member Schwede, Council Member Marine and I attended. The CEO provided his report. It was also shared in today's meeting. Board composition is conducted every four years and was most recently completed in 2020. Our committee was briefed on agency governance scenarios that reflect future population and service growth. And the committee also discussed board advisory committee operations. The next executive committee meeting is scheduled for April 15th at 1130 AM. Um, the next one would be finance performance and oversight committee, council member Schwede. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, March 18, 2021, via Zoom. Uh, CEO Rick uh, Eldon Fritz, other agent staff, and board members Tom Merrill, Sid Roberts, and I attended. On the consent agenda, approval of February 2021 expenditures and payroll items C through G. On reports, uh, fourth quarter 2020 transit police report. Uh, Lieutenant David Bowman briefed the committee on this report. A copy is included in your packet. I really encourage you guys to read that, please. Um, fourth quarter 2020 financial report unaudited. As of December 31, operating revenues totaled 246.4 million, 9.9 .9 million more than budgeted. Community transit exceeded expectations, collecting, collecting 154.4 million in sales tax revenue, 3.9% more than budgeted. All categories of expenditures came in under or very close to budget at 89.2% of budget. Operating expenses totaled 153.8 million, which is a favorable variance of 18.7 million. A copy of this report is included in your packet. Uh, February 21 sales tax report, community transit collected approximately 16.6 million in sales tax, which was approximately 4.7 million more than budgeted. This is for purchases made in December. February 2021 diesel fuel report, 
Year to date, community transit paid an average of $1.78 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2021 budgeted amount of $1.75 per gallon. Uh, the budget team continues to monitor fuel costs because they are going up. Uh, the next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled for 2 p.m. Thursday, April 15, via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Schwede. Next one is Strategic Alignment Capital Development Committee, Councilmember Marine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee meeting was held remotely over Zoom on Wednesday the 17th at 2 p.m. The council was attended by my, or the meeting was attended by myself, Councilmember Tom Merrill, Labor Representative Lance Norton, Mayor Nicholas Smith, and Councilmember Stephanie Wright. The committee reviewed and forwarded one item to today's consent agenda, and that is RFP 2021-22, the Apollo Video Management Software. This item is for the purchase of software upgrades to improve camera technology on community transit buses. In addition, the upgrade will automate the video retrieval process uh, from those cameras. A quote in the amount of 260,000 from vendor Apollo Video Technology is fair and reasonable, and the project cost was approved by the Board of Directors in the 2021 budget. The committee also heard one informational item, and that was the status of the Linwood Transportation Pilot Program, and you're well aware staff gave a detailed presentation in our board meeting today. Uh, and finally, the committee was briefed on a real estate matter, and this matter was moved to an executive session later at today's board meeting. The next meeting will be held Wednesday, the 21st. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Marine. All right, the next thing we have on the agenda is the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion. I will move approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, moved by Joe Marine and seconded by Stephanie Wright. Any discussions on the motion? I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Pass unanimously. All right. Uh, we have no action items. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. Um, so next is the chair's report. I'm going to make it just slightly more than three minutes. I don't have anything to say today. So um, <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, to board communications, and I'll start with Mr. Gallagher. No, oh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't okay. supposed to do that, Mr. Gallagher. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've already been admonished for that once. I better, better get my list here so I can get the right people here. Uh, Councilmember Marine. I have nothing at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Merrill. I guess the hands up, I don't have anything. Got it. Um, Mr. Nering. I have nothing either. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Norton. I have nothing, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norton. Mr. Roberts. Well, I, a bunch of bashful people today. I, I will go ahead and say that I really did enjoy having Rick come up to Stanwood. And you know, with Zoom, I had never met him personally. And I'm 6'1", and he got off the bus, and I thought it was Detlef Shrimp. I mean, he's a pretty tall fellow. And uh, but we had a great time and uh, hobnobbing around town, had lunch, and really appreciate him coming up here. And, and I think the, the exciting thing was to actually, as he mentioned, to go to the area of uh, pretty extensive growth and kind of be, begin to think out loud uh, what could happen there. So that was, uh, that was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And if you think there was a little bit of a strain for you to look up that far, what do you think I had to go through? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Jen Schwede. I'm good. I don't have anything. Thank you. Mayor Smith. Yeah, I'm joining the I don't have anything group. Thanks. All right. And Council Member Stephanie Wright. Same club. Nothing to report. Well, Sid, you're the only one that did it. Way to go. Chairman Daughtry, this is Tom Merrill. I couldn't find my unmute button on this um, new device that I was using. I did have something that I wanted to put in. No, I feel like, sorry. Afraid. Yeah, that, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, first off, I'm look, greatly looking forward to seeing Rick and Roland next 
Monday at uh, in the city of Snohomish, and I just wanted to let them know that they will be attending the inaugural first meeting on our restored Carnegie building. And we're all praying that the furniture shows up and is in place before Monday afternoon. <laughs> um, that's all I had to say, but thank you for coming. We're looking forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. All right, uh, moving on. I'm gonna get back to my thing here. I guess the last thing we have is an executive session. And in order to do this executive session, we are going to leave this Zoom meeting and enter into another Zoom meeting. So I will see you all on the other side. Just wait. Uh, you have to say what, what the subject oh, is. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right, Al. Thank you. This is about. Um, uh, it's considering the selection of a site and acquisition of real estate, and it'll be for twenty about twenty minutes, subject and, to extensions. And there's no action to follow, so we will be coming back into this Zoom to adjourn from the meeting. Okay, thank you, Alan, for uh, backing me out of that. Okay, thank you. It, you think, Rachel? Hey, it's okay to proceed and adjourn. I was okay. looking for Al, actually. Oh, we were Al. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to adjourn if you need one. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for adjournment. And if there was no other business, I uh, call for a vote. Aye. All in favor say aye. 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 I think Jan said bye. Is that right? Oh. <laughs> bye and bye. Bye yeah. and same thing. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see so you everyone. again soon. And Thanks, uh, remember, guys. we have a uh, workshop coming up on April 15th. But uh, we also have a board meeting prior to that. So I'll see you then. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I just want to tell you how impressed I am that you matched your.